We're mostly just going to look at some pictures today. It might be a kind of brief lesson. Um, we spent a full week looking at graphs of sines and cosines. That was productive. I'm glad we did it. We obviously, we have four trig functions left and we can't now spend a full week on tangents, cotangents and then another week on secants, cosecants. So we're gonna satisfy ourselves just with knowing basically what these graphs look like, and then looking at like A and B and C and D and seeing what happens when we mess around with them. So here, You've already probably seen this a few times, but here's the graph of the tangent. Um, unlike the sine and the cosine, the tangent is not defined everywhere. And that's because the tangent There we go. The tangent again is the sine divided by the cosine. And the cosine of x has an infinite number of roots. It keeps being zero. And whenever the cosine is zero, this tangent isn't defined. So, in spite of that, there are real world situations that can be modeled with a graph that looks basically like this. Like if, um, I sort of the classic example, I guess, would be if you have a wall. What we'll call, I'll say the wall extends from negative infinity to infinity. And then you have like a police car or something that's sitting next to the wall and shining a light onto the wall. And, you know, on a police car or something like that, the light will spin. It's able to rotate. So let's say that the light can rotate between 180 degrees and zero degrees. Or I guess, I don't know why I suddenly switched to degrees, except out of habit. Zero radians and pi radians. And I think this is actually gonna end up being the cotangent instead of the tangent but you'll get the general idea. We look at where this light is on the wall. Let's call this zero on the number line. And as this light rotates to zero radians, I mean, as this light producing apparatus rotates to zero radians, you see that it's going to get further and further down the wall. So as we go to zero radians, we go up to positive infinity. And likewise, as we approach pi radians, we go down to negative infinity. As we rotate in this direction, the light moves to the left. 
So as I predicted, this didn't end up actually being the tangent. It ended up being, we'll see, um, some kind of variation on the cotangent. But the basic idea where we have two vertical asymptotes and we go up towards infinity and down towards negative infinity can show up in real world situations. Um, so you should know more or less what the tangent looks like. You should know that it's that shape repeated over and over again. And you should know that the distance between asymptotes is pi. So the tangent is periodic, just like the um, sine and the cosine. It's the same shape repeated over and over again. But unlike the sine and the cosine, the period of the tangent is pi, not two pi. And then, and here's where I'm going to depart from the book, because the book, well, the book's a little weirdly structured. I mean, the, when, in, when the book covers the sine and the cosine, you know, everything has its own section. The amplitude has its own section. The period has its own section. And um, the book sort of realizes that it would be overkill to do this with all of the trig functions. So when we have the tangent, there isn't like an entire section on the period, but then it, but then the author decides to put all that material in the book. So it's exactly the same amount of material. It's just that it's all crammed into a single section. I am not going to do that. I'm just going to look briefly at what happens if we put the letters A, B, C, and D into the same locations we had them when we were looking at the sinusoidal function. And for, uh, for comparison, Let's remind ourselves what each of these things does to the a sinusoidal function, to something like the sine. So let's see, maybe I'll maybe I'll set D down to zero here. And maybe I'll set C down to zero. So when you have a sign, A controls the amplitude. Increasing A pulls the sign up. Decreasing A towards zero smushes the sign down. Now, when you have a tangent, it no longer gets a name. It's not called the amplitude, but A does precisely the same thing. Increasing A, as we see, takes the graph of the tangent and stretches it up. Decreasing A takes the graph of the tangent and smushes it down towards the axis. So it's not called the amplitude anymore, but it's doing the same thing. 
that it did when we were looking at sinusoidal functions. It's pulling the graph out or smushing it together. What about B? Um, well, with the sinusoidal function, B controlled the period. Increasing B decreases the period. It smushes everything together. Sending B towards zero increases the period. It takes the graph and it stretches it horizontally. So maybe it won't be a great surprise when I say that's exactly what B does when we have a tangent curve. And again, sort of um, just like this A has a name when we're looking at sinusoidal functions, but not when we're looking at this tangent curve. I mean, this is called the sinusoidal function. This is not called the anisoidal function. It's not given any kind of name. It's just, here's a tangent function that we're messing around with. But anyway, we were looking at B. Increasing B decreases the period. It takes this curve and it smushes everything in towards the y-axis. Then decreasing B pulls it apart again. A sinusoidal function, did not mean to do that. Let's try that again. So for the sinusoidal function, the C is a horizontal shift. Throw this tangent in there. C continues to be a horizontal shift. You see the tangent curve move to the left and the right. And that leaves D. D was a vertical shift. Precisely the same with the tangent curve. Increasing D shifts this up. Decreasing D shifts this down. So without wanting to go into all of the details, this A, B, C, and D does the same thing to the tangent that it does to the sine, and that it does to the cosine. And we're going to see it, that same pattern repeat three more times with the cotangent, secant, and cosecant, where A, B, C, and D just change these in a very predictable way. Speaking of the cotangent, so on that, um, when I was looking at that police light example, I mentioned that I managed to produce not the tangent, but the cotangent. Here is what the cotangent looks like. Here is the picture I produced when we were looking at the police lights. We did indeed create something that looks like the cotangent. So just like the tangent, the, um, the cotangent is periodic. Just like the tangent, the cotangent has these vertical asymptotes. Just like the tangent, the period of the cotangent is pi instead of two pi. 
but it's a kind of fixed version of the tangent. Whereas the tangent goes up, the cotangent goes down. Something else I should emphasize is that the tangent and the cotangent both have these infinitely many vertical asymptotes, but they're showing up in different spacing. If we, um, if we look at the tangent and the cotangent together, Well, we see first, again, sort of what I said, that these um, graphs are kind of thick versions of each other. But second, where, whereas the tangent has, let me, I feel like sometimes this is helpful, but sometimes graphs can get very overcrowded. So let's look for a vertical asymptote of the tangent. That's the sine over the cosine. So the vertical asymptotes will occur when the cosine is zero, pi over two is such a vertical asymptote. If we remove those distractors, we can see this. The tangent crawls up this vertical asymptote. If we now look at the cotangent, Pi over two is not a vertical asymptote. We can, in fact, say where the vertical asymptotes are for each of these. This is the tangent. Its vertical asymptotes are at pi divided by two plus or minus n pi. So pi over two, pi over two plus pi, pi over two plus two pi, pi over two plus three pi, pi over two minus pi, pi over two minus, you know. The pattern repeats. For the cotangent, the vertical asymptotes don't have that pi over two term in them. They're at pi or two pi or three pi or negative pi and so on. And then, and again, here's where I'm going to move significantly in a significantly risker way than the book. I'm basically just gonna throw a picture on here. And then I'm going to make the observation that just like with the sine, cosine, and tangent, this A stretches the graph vertically, or it smushes the graph down. The smushing the graph down is kind of hard to see because Let's see, like, let's have a smaller step size. Then maybe we can see here. Smush, 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 smush. Until zero, it gets smushed down so far that it becomes a horizontal line. 
it can't be stretched enough to become just a vertical line. It cannot. It can become like if we let if we let a be sufficiently large, it can be, you know, something where if you look at the graph, you probably cannot see a difference between these and a bunch of vertical lines, but it isn't quite vertical. So let's let's return this to one. So with some um, with the sine, cosine, and tangent, this B controlled the period, increasing B smushed the curve together horizontally. Decreasing B pulls the curve apart horizontally, again, precisely what we see here. With the sine, cosine, and tangent, this is a horizontal shift, exactly what we see here. With the sine, cosine, and tangent, this is a vertical shift, exactly what we see here. And now let's look at the secant and the cosecant. And unlike the others, I'm not totally sure what uh, what our real world application of these graphs would look like. I mean, the secant at least is so important because it shows up a lot in calculus. It's thus that its graph has a lot of real world applications. But let's take a picture of the secant and it looks like that. So it's periodic, it's the same picture repeated over and over again. Um, it's periodic with a period of 2 pi this time. So let's see if I can fig work this out. Oops. Negative I know that's not what I want. Negative three pi divided by two is less than X. Is less than, no, that's not it. There. So this is a this interval from negative three pi over two to pi over two is four pi over two equals two pi units long. So the period is two pi. This shape repeats over and over again. And there's a vertical asymptote right in the middle of the period. So that's sort of, that's different from the tangent, which had vertical asymptotes, but they were neatly dividing the periods into chunks. Here, the vertical asymptote is inside a standard period. So why? What's with this graph? So well, let's try to work this out. The secant is one divided by the cosine. Here is the cosine. So the secant, just like the tangent, which is the sine over the cosine, has vertical asymptotes whenever the cosine is equal to zero. So x equals pi divided by two. 
x equals negative pi divided by two x equals uh, three pi. That's not, yeah, no, I should have believed in myself. X equals three pi divided by two and so on. So we have all of these vertical asymptotes. So let's zoom in. Let's, uh, yeah, let's zoom in so that we're just looking at these vertical asymptotes and what's happening between them. Well, between these vertical asymptotes, this cosine is always negative. One divided by a negative number is negative. So the secant is always negative. They touch at one. One divided by one equals one. However, look at what happens at at two, for example. At two, this number is a decimal, 0. 0.416. It's between zero and one. And taking one and dividing it by something like one half or one fourth or whatever makes the number bigger than one. Like one divided by negative one tenth is negative ten. One divided by negative one one thousandth is negative one thousand. So because these numbers are small, that's why these numbers are big in absolute value, I mean. But that's why there isn't any graph of the secant in this area. The secant can never be this small because the cosine can never be large. The cosine is always between negative one and one. And then as we get closer and closer to this asymptote, so one divided by this y coordinate gets bigger and bigger in absolute value. So the secant gets bigger and bigger in absolute value. That is to say, it goes down. Ooh, the host doesn't like this. You can see those asymptotes render in real time. But it's the same principle here. Between these asymptotes, the cosine is always positive, so the secant is always positive. The curves touch at one value, one divided by one equals one. And then because the cosine is always small, it's taking on values that are always less than one. The secant is always big. It's taking on values that are always greater than one. And that is the secant. And let me get rid of these distractors. And even though there are going to be absolutely no surprises, I'll go through the formality of looking at these coefficients. This A, either stretches the secant up. It looks a little different than the other stretching because the, um, now when we stretch these curves up, we're physically dragging them. 
away from the x-axis, but either this curve is being smushed towards the axis when A is small, or it's being stretched away from the axis when A is big. Changing B is going to mess around with the period. Increasing B smushes everything together. Decreasing B pulls everything apart. This is a horizontal shift, just like we're used to. This is a vertical shift, just like we're used to. Uh, with the secant, it's possible. Um, notice that this D is pulling the entire curve up. Compare that to A. A pulled the top half of the curve up, but it pulled the bottom half of the curve down. So it's pulling these things away from one another. By contrast, D is pulling them both in the same direction, both down, both up. I questions. And they're virtually done rather ahead of time, but again, I don't want to drown us in new material right before the test. Um, the cosecant is going to be, maybe you could have predicted this, um, the cosecant is to the sine what the secant is to the cosine. So it has these asymptotes, Whenever the sign is zero, between the asymptotes, it's either always positive or always negative. The reason that the cosecant only takes values up here or down here, the reason the cosecant never takes any small values in here, is again because the sign is small, and one divided by a small number is big. And uh, vertical stretching, Vertical smushing, horizontal smushing, horizontal stretching, horizontal shifting, vertical shifting. And as befits a section that we went through quite quickly, the homework in this section is quite short and it's all conceptual questions. Like, why is this true? Or explain this. There aren't any like, draw a period of five times the cosecant of 2x minus seven plus one, the stuff that we made you do for the sine and the cosine, we're not making you do for the other four trig functions. You should basically just know these general shapes.
Okay, I'll try to get some kind of review for you and we can talk about it on Wednesday. See you then.